Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio. Um, this is CJ Graham. We're here with Eden the Fourth Power. Um, once again, you can phone, phone in on our lines or you can email us or you can do us on the website. Okay? Today I have my special guest here, um, a great friend of mine, Dr. David Morgan. Um, he's been a friend of mine for about two years. I don't know, about what? Been about seven years? Yes. About seven years. He's currently on the on the school board out there in the South Suburbans. Um, 227. 227. Okay. Um, he's also a former educator of Chicago Public Schools. He's been a p- professor um, in, in colleges. Um, he's wrote several books, which one of the ones we will discuss today. And um, tell a little bit more about yourself and your background, Dr. Morgan. Well, my educational career began in Chicago Public Schools as a teacher, then a principal, and a central office administrator. Uh, two thirds of my that was two thirds of my career. My, the other third of my career, I was college professor in Rhode Island, professor of education, university supervisor of student teachers in Kentucky, professor of education, university supervisor of first teachers and principals and superintendents, mm-hmm. and basically doing the same things at in Northern Illinois University, uh, and. Since that time, upon retirement from uh, in 2004, I have taught part-time at colleges and universities in the area, mainly in the uh, south suburbs, but also at Columbia College, and uh, some teaching at Roosevelt University. All right, so you and, you got a diverse background in education from the Chicago Public Schools to the community colleges to the universities. Um, I remember on the way we were discussing about your situation um, moving from northern Illinois, from northern Illinois to, um, used to commute, used to take that long ride and then Mm -hmm. used to stay in a hotel. Um, No. uh, So you did a lot of moving around during your time. In an apartment. Okay, okay. And and you're happily married, right? You're happily married? Yes, I am. How long have you been married, Dr. Morgan? Oh, so about 32 years. About 32 years, yes. okay. Right. So when we talk about education, we're dealing with the, the past, present, and future. You're out there in the south suburb. I've been, I've been out in the south suburb for, um, well, almost all my life. i say over 40 years. And I've seen some adjustments we have made. And, man, you have fought a lot of battles out there in 227, where you're at right now. Um uh, what made you decide to, to put in an input out there in, in the school districts out that way? Well, number one, because I live in the community. How long have you lived in the community? My wife and I bought a lot in Olympia Fields and built a home there in 1993, moved in in 1994, July 1st, 1994, from Chicago. Okay. But what made uh, you decide to make the, the step and to say, I want to be on that board and and put in some input, because I know you've been doing it all your life, but to, how did you decide in such a, because... Well, um, after I retired from uh, the school system, I proceeded to teach part-time at the uh, Prairie State College at... Uh, in Chicago Heights? In Chicago Heights? Uh, South Suburban College, mm-hmm. and uh, also downtown at Columbia College. And teaching at those two colleges in the South Suburb, Prairie State and South Suburban, many of these uh, students from these schools were there, and uh, they came. They were in my classrooms. Mm-hmm. Many of them were disappointed because they had not received. Finally, they finally realized they had not received the education that uh, they had been told they were receiving when they were. And during their four years of high school in Rich Township High School District 227, and as a result, they were disappointed. And uh, upon having come to one of those two uh, junior colleges and uh, couldn't pass the entrance exam and having to take the uh, prep classes, pre- college pre-prep classes before being admitted as a regular college student, and as a result, they were disappointed in that. Right, and, and I see that also, when, when I, go ahead, go ahead. As I uh, uh, studied uh, the uh, situation in the three high schools, Rich East and Park Forest, Rich South, 
in Richland Park and Rich Central and Olympia Fields where I live, I realized that we were, they were getting a, a subpar education and people uh, were very concerned about that, so much so until uh, a charter school was born under the direction and leadership of Dr. Blending Davis. And uh, since that time, uh, the people uh, the, and the students in uh, South Suburban Chicago has had a choice as to how uh, their children can be educated. But at this time, uh, we have three schools who are not performing up to par when where 80% of our children are not ready for college and successful careers when they finish high school. Okay. And of course, many uh, parents in the South Suburbs send their children to private schools, Morgan Park Academy in the city, uh, uh, Marion Catholic uh, High School in the South Suburbs, and other places to ensure that they are educated to the limits of their talents. Okay. But now, what now. my concern is, is that the impact of schools that are not doing well on our community, on our tax dollars, and on the quality of life in that, those communities. Right. And I know that... Which is... Uh, but more than the quality of life, the quality of life of, their, of these students and their future. And I think we could do a much better job. We're too high on low expectations right. as a school board. Okay. Because we discussed this many times that they're getting the economics out there in the south suburbs. The, the, I think the estimated um, per child um, payment that the taxpayers are paying is like 17000 per student. Yes. That's comparable to Naperville, Winneka, the top schools the in the country. Am I correct? Top performing schools in the area. So we're getting financially, we are, our, our students in that particular community that, because you wrote a book, your book is called... Um, an Unbroken Educational Apartheid Legacy with Chicago, South Suburban, Predominantly Black Communities of Color. So your focus is that you, on your last book, it's a 500-page book. It discusses the situation and the circumstances on how this has happened where the most, um, would you say, educated community in, in the United States, in the South Suburb, we have educated parents. But for some reason, these kids are going to school and they're receiving a subpar education, but we're paying high-end revenue to, to teach them. Am I correct? Yes, but this particular book is 254 pages. Two, no, this one 250. I'm, not, my, my apologies. My apologies. Uh, my but uh, to make a long story mm -hmm. short, we're concerned about the education of our children. We're concerned about their future. Uh, and we're concerned about what can be easily done developing a school system that can educate all of our children and ensure that they uh, can do uh, ready to uh, go to college when they finish high school. More of our children should be able to do that. Right. Beyond I, just 20%. Right. And I remember when and you were... to be able to do the work of the modern world, uh, to take their place as equal citizens okay. with others. Right. And many times when we discussed, when I attended the board meetings, when I attended the board meetings on how the struggle is, and you discuss it in your book about dealing with the board members. What do you think overall that, that um, in order for the, the schools to be successful, we, we know it's a lot of politics, especially dealing with you being a teach, former teacher of Chicago Public School and now being in the suburbs. What, how, what kind of effect do you think the board has on the education of the children in the community? The board is the uh, leader, should be the leader in all of this. It should be the leader in boards at successful suburban schools have more than a job. They have a mission. Building schools which truly educate our children. They have a vision of what a good school should be. Through school improvement planning, we open up a process which can revitalize and rebuild our schools. And when boards don't do this, the results is what we can see clearly in the south suburbs, and not just in the south suburbs, all over this nation. We have boards, uh, when we have a board who is uh, proactive, who, who is willing to learn, 
and is willing to become effective by simply doing the right thing. And the purpose of having a school board is to represent our community, but it, beyond that, it is to represent uh, the children and to uh, ensure the role of a board member is to improve student performance levels and to productively and democratically engage the school district community to achieve that goal. Right, and I remember a lot of you talked about, and, and you focus on bringing policies and procedures that they fail to follow through to get the proper policies and procedures. You remember you discussed well, that a lot of times? developing policies and procedures and uh, getting them approved and then acting on them. That is the key. Acting on them is the key to all of this. Mm -hmm. And when boards are doing that, schools are failing and children are not getting uh, the education that they deserve. Right. And what effect, because the E to the fourth power, and you know that I focus on economic education entitlement and sponsorship, how does that affect the economic aspect of education in our community? How does it affect us? It affects uh, our, not just the economics, but it affects every area of our community lives from economics to academic improvement to uh, everything that we are dealing with here. And that's why uh, having a vision is so important. Someone once said, we better pay attention to the future because that's where we're gonna spend the rest of our lives. And yet too often these, uh, these are just uh, words for uh, some school boards, you know, finding themselves fixed almost entirely on the present. Or they dream about the future, but they do nothing about it. And so their dream seems at best elusive and at worst unattainable. But to believe that we cannot do any better than having only 20% of our children ready for college and careers at the time of high school graduation is a mistake. And that's why it's so important for boards to be trained. They are to be willing to learn, especially boards who are not in the field of, who have not had a career in the field of education. We need to know what a vision is. We need to know what positive educational leadership looks like. And we need to study the key work of school boards, guidebook, and other uh, major uh, guides that teaches us how to be an effective board member. Okay, and we discussed that because I, I remember when you first started, you were stand alone, and then you took control, tried to take control with the members and everything. But you always focus on policies and procedures. Now, when because we that's what boards do; they are policy makers. The boards are not employers in the school district. The employers have to do the work that the board's uh, policies outline for them. Okay, now and a lot of times you discussed, and we discussed it here yesterday, earlier today, about the African American young men and boys that are growing up today. And we see the struggle that they ha are having. Um, we have the young ladies getting their education and getting their degrees and things. What do you think, is, is, uh, give me a couple of things that maybe we can do our, what's holding us back from preparing for the future, uh, what's holding us up presently to keep um, the, the young African-American male from succeeding in the school system? Well, as a board member, I'm interested in focusing on making not only coming off probation in the state's wash, academic wash list, but to ensure that uh, the South Suburban schools are built to become the best some of the best schools in this, uh, in our communities and in the nation as well. We are heirs of a past that gives us every reason to believe that we can do this when we do the right thing and are committed to making a difference in the world of education. Vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision just passes the time. Vision with action
can change the world. So you think and in order to change things within the African American In future? order to change our educational system and make it better in the South suburbs and all across this nation, we need a vision. We need, we need uh, an educational vision. Uh, uh, we need positive educational leadership. Okay. Give me we an need example. to develop parent and community leadership. So you say we need to improve teaching and accountability. Okay. We need good management. In other words, we need uh, the principles that apply to not only schooling and education, but to any successful organization. We need uh, uh, the visions. We need the standards. Okay. We I, can't be too uh, high on low expectations. I we remember need, you as a principal. You may talk about principal. Okay, well, go ahead. Go ahead. You want to finish? We that? need assessments. Okay. You cannot hold, have people hold accountability unless you have assessments. And what I mean by assessments, we need to look at the data, the school improvement data, the, the test scores, the uh, assessment measures that students uh, and schools use to uh, determine whether or not we're making a difference in the school system. We need uh, a, uh, alignment of resources, uh, uh, and we need a, by de doing these things, we can develop a climate and culture of excellence in public education. Now, you mentioned to me, when you just brought up data, that um, for some reason they don't use the data that's presented to them to truly educate our kids in the school system. Now, when you said that... The first know, thing we need to do in order to uh, address data is that we need to set some goals. And those goals should be school year goals. And they should be presented, developed between the board and the school district, uh, with the superintendent and the school district, at, before the beginning of the school year, during the summer. In fact, we're going to meet on Saturday. And I have been stressing to this board that we must develop with the superintendent and district on Saturday some board goals for the 2016-2017 school year. A school district without goals is like a ship without a rudder. You don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, you're not going anywhere because you're not headed, and you don't have a direction. Right, and within this school district, and uh, that means uh, having a goal. Also means looking at data. Right. It yes. means looking at uh, school district benchmarks. It means uh, measuring those goals that we have set for ourselves against the data to see if we are achieving those goals. Okay. Now, Dr. Morgan, within the school district that you currently work in, um, we have seen. About how many new superintendents in the last five years? Wouldn't that affect the overall productivity of the production of the board? Somewhere or between five and six, five, if not more. Four, five or six superintendents in the last yes. six Inter years? And, and they're all interim. Nobody's evaluated. Do you no goals that, have been set. And that, that obviously affects the productivity and the goals that you set. And, and um, It doesn't just affect the productivity, sir. Mm-hmm. It keeps uh, the board focused on low expectations and no expectations. You can't have any organization, including a school district, functioning well in the absence of accountability, in the absence of having a goal. Uh, uh, Yale University study found that 3% of the people who have goals and practice them produces more than the other 97% who didn't. So goals are not just important, they're indispensable. And when we're not doing that, we're not go we see the situation that we have now okay. in the school district. Now, you said, because I remember when you were a principal, you bought one particular school out of the probationary From period. Prob 
mission okay. to ex academic excellence okay. could in you, West Inglewood. Could you, could you tell us about that? Well, basically... To be sure, because we're going to go to a commercial break. So let's hold that thought. Sure. We're going to go to a commercial break in about a minute. But um, so far we have discussed your vision. The, 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 super, the, 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 the school needs some type of vision. Yes. They need to set goals. They need to utilize the data that's to assess them to be a successful school. They need to realize the resources and set high expectations. So when you got, like you said, when you don't have a steady um, environment, you receive low expectations, expectations and no expectations levels. We, have, we must have a dream if we're going to make a dream come true. Okay. Winners in life have lifetime goals. And what I... What we did to bring a school off probation, working with the community, the parents, the staff at the school, is that we followed a regular process to review student performance levels to ensure continuous improvement. Okay. All right. Now, everybody has a role in that. Okay. Uh, We're going to discuss that when we come back from a sure. commercial break about... Of course. performance and guidelines for the kids, okay? And this is what makes for excellence in public education when we are using formative and summative assessment uh, data to drive instruction and improvement. Okay. Educational improvement, academic improvement. Okay, let's move 90.5 FMAD Radio. We're here with Dr. Morgan, a lifetime educator. Um, we'll be right back. And um, after we pause for commercial. Join Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio for three incredible days of music, music empowerment, and family. Fun. We'll be broadcasting live from the historic Idlewild Resort on Williams Island in Idlewild, Michigan, all weekend all long. long. The fest is held to commemorate and celebrate the history of well-known African-American entertainers and professionals who performed and owned property at the resort prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. See live performances by Paul B. Smith, T. Lucas and the Urban Jazz Coalition, Althea Renee and Demetrius Neighbors, Paul Dozier and Margaret Bell, Paula Atherton and New Era, Kimmy Horn, Markeel Jordan, and the incomparable Angela Wimbush. So make sure you join us July 10th through the 12th at the Idlewild Music Fest on Williams Island in Idlewild, Wild, Michigan. Michigan. For tickets and more information, go to IdlewildMusicFest.org. Idlewild and Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio. Now that's a match made in heaven. Taste a theater stage play from great directors and actors across the country. This is my TV. Don't you see my name on there? What to say? Mud to the damn D E. That's right. Here's Rob G, back with the smoothest jazz tunes that will lift your spirits. It's Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio. Not the same old boring station, with the same old boring music. Join WGSJBC Radio, broadcasts, and clear, uninterrupted commercials with breaking news stories. Cam video of the arrest of the Chicago area woman who Local died. traffic. Stevenson, it's moving slowly inbound. And weather from across the country. 81 degrees to high, partly cloudy skies. Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio. iHeart Radio podcasting live and HD Radio Channel 2, Channel 3. You're back. All right, here we are. This is C.J. Graham with E to the Fourth Power. We have my special guest here with Dr. Dr. David Morgan. Um, you can call in to us at 630-215-8582. Okay, you can also email us at gsjbcradio at gmail.com. Also, our website is wgsjbcradio.com. Okay, once again, Radio 630-215-8582. Like I say, we're here talking to... Um, a lifetime educator, um, Dr. David Morgan. We're going to, we're going to address uh, how the performance you come off probation. Okay. And okay. the performance. Right. Now you're going to have to get your own radio station, man, because you'd be just telling me what to do, man. This yes. Is, this is this <laughs> either the four power, C. J. Graham, man. We're going to have to get you your own radio station, but we're going to have you back because you're going to be able to cover more in depth to pulling out everything we can to get to yeah. the people about what you have. And I would like to discuss uh, briefly that. How do you, uh, what do you do when you're on 
probation in the states of watch list and won't uh, go ahead and discuss it. What now. do you do for educational improvement to achieve educational excellence in public education? What do you do? Well, as a as I started to say before, you follow a regular process to review student performance levels to ensure continuous improvement, form using formative and summative assessment. Now in each of these roles, the superintendent as well as the board, school board, has a role to play. The board uh, drives education, should drive educational improvement and accountability. And as a result, they should follow this process to review student achievement data to ensure continuous improvement. That's the role of the school board. Now, what is the role of the superintendent working with the board in order to achieve excellence in public education. Okay, let me cut well, you off for a second, Dr. Morton. Mm -hmm. Let me cut you off for one second. So right now what you're saying is is that you think it's not so much, if you think the problem within the school classes, you think it's more involved in the political process of us being able to present what we want from the superintendent to the board. It Go ahead. starts right there at the very top, the leadership. So it's just like a corporation where if we don't have great leadership, we're not going to have a great school district. Okay. And for every great school, it's great leaders. It's great leadership. Okay. So the, it starts at the top. Leadership with a vision. Okay. As I said before, positive okay. educational leadership. And it's a that's open why, parent and community leadership. And that's why it's so important to vote, right? Improving teaching. Right. Good management. Then right. that's why it's so important not just vote, but to be informed on who to vote for. Right. Because and a lot to of know what their records are or lack of of uh, educational improvement. Right. Not just vote for a friend, vote for somebody who, who can actually, you know, somebody not talk to talk but actually walk to walk. Is That's that what you're saying, Doctor Morgan? Just voting for a friend is not going to help us at all if a friend is not committed to educational success. Mm -hmm and improvement and doing what is in the best interest of children because the role of school boards is to improve student performance levels and to productively engage the school district community to achieve that goal. And that's what I want to get to. Go ahead. Uh, we have a role to play as a uh, school board uh, which is following that process to review student performance level. In other words, looking at the data to ask those significant questions. Where are we as a school district? Where do we want to be? By when? What will it take to get there? What will it cost? So that by the mid-year, the f end of the f first semester, you can ask these, answer these significant questions. How far have we come? Are we still on course? Now, and see. following the goals that we have set in the 2016-2017 school year. So you're just saying education, this, this information, hold on, this information transcend color then. Yes. It's, it transcend color. It's not just about black and white and These color. These are principles for life. As Abraham Lincoln once said, people pass away, but principles never do. They live on forever. But uh, getting back to... Uh, uh, go ahead. I love your quotes. The... Uh, role of the board in all of this, following a regular process to reuse student achievement data. The superintendent's role working with the board is to recommend to the board a process for continuous improvement. The superintendent's role is also to set and review benchmarks and performance indicators that indicate uh, and demonstrate student progress related to the district's strategic plan, and also to the district's uh, standards. Okay, now, uh, let me cut you off. I'm going to cut you off again, Dr. Morgan. We at the Chicago Public Schools, because they don't operate on that type of system that the way that they do it in the suburbs. Any time that you are following principles, you are operating on that type of system. Is that why the Chicago Public Schools has failed so much in, 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 in the in, in, in the public school and in that that um, charter school that you, we created out in the south suburb, they send so many academic, um, their students, 90% of their well, students of the go charter to college. school, I want to uh, say that uh, I am the only member on this two, two, Rich Township 227 board who voted for the charter school because at that time, in 2010, it was, ever, it was more than plain and clear to me 
that the district would continue to go backwards and not address the significant problems and the needs to improve student performance levels. But the charter school is the positives and negatives to a charter school. I mean, well, that was a nothing successful is perfect. Run. Nothing okay. is perfect. Because a lot of them but are not But it is by far the best uh, alternative to what we have now in the public schools. And our role as school board members sitting on that school board is to get the public schools up and running so that they can reattract the people that we have lost. Uh who have right. gone on to right. a better educational system. We want, uh, in other words, we live in a competitive society, and in order to uh, have a functioning, high-performance school system means that uh, the charter school wouldn't matter because we would have the same thing that they had. So competition is a good thing. It is a good thing in that regard. In that regard. Okay. Because it, uh, the idea is to educate all children to the limits of their talents, whether in the public school or in the charter school. The children shouldn't be missing anything because they're in a public school. Okay, so they shouldn't be uh, undereducated because right. they're and not ready for college and successful careers when they graduate from high school because they're in a public school. That's what we're trying to get uh, the schools off probation in the state's academics. Uh, Watch list. Right, because you talked about the colleges. Because I remember when I go to college, and they and I see my nieces and nephews, they go on to college. But some of them, like you said, when they get there, they are not prepared. They got to take this pre course, pre college, the, pre college prep. So they got to take these classes. And I've seen it not only in community college, but in university. But my thing is, is once you, I remember when I graduated from college, but they wanted you to take a written exam. After you spent 120 hours at the university level of taking all the courses, but then they gave you a written exam. And then if you didn't pass that written exam, after 120 hours of going to school, four years, they're taking your academic, your student loan, your money, your financial aid. And then they test you for the U.S. Constitution. And if you didn't pass the U.S. Constitution, after 120 hours, you still couldn't graduate. Is that a, is that a flawed system? Wouldn't you think that a philosophy? If you don't been to school, like you said, they're not prepared in high school. But then when you go to college and then you finish all the courses, then they say we want you to take a written exam in order to graduate. But you don't finish 120 hours, which is four years of school, four times. Is I, that, is I that a flaw system? I am not familiar with a written exam in order to graduate. The only thing I'm familiar with is that for for each course you take, you uh, you you graded right. based on your average. Right. You are you graduate. Right, right. Well, I mean, this is happening in the public schools and the universities that I've been to, and I yeah. see it happening. I know you probably don't know that part about that part, but this is the part that I have to deal with. And some people, you're going, you you got some people going to school. They send you to college, but actually, you're going to high school a fifth year for the freshman year. Is this pre? How is this where you can go get well, you paying? But you're using financial aid. To, uh, meet you know, the something wrong with the system. To meet the requirements if you but, need to uh, take classes. But I've seen you admitted to, how can you be admitted to a university, pay the same financial it's really cost? It's really up uh, and, to uh, the student how fast they're going to go, whether it's going to take three years, four years, or five years. But, Dr. Morgan, I've seen people who scored 12 on the ACT test got masters in, in, in degrees. So the, the flawed system, too, is that scores is not truly reflective of, of the level of education you can receive I mean what you can do stick to this right but I'm just saying I'm just we, we're going to talk a little off base a little bit but I'm just saying and I want to discuss with you because I know you want don't want to get off base we can go back on base and talk about what you want to talk about but um, we can we yeah can, my main concern okay. really is okay. uh, how are we going to get out of the uh, situation that we're in not okay. just in our District 227 community, mm -hmm. but in the whole South suburbs where predominantly black children, the majority of them are not ready for college and successful careers okay. when they finish high school. Right. But this is not just in uh, Chicago's South suburbs. This is all across America where uh, it's called the academic uh, uh, achievement gap. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's 
my concern. How can we close that gap? Okay. So that uh, more children are ready to go on and finish college, to do the work of the modern world, to take their place as equal citizens with others. And that's why that's why I got you here. We're here at ninety point five FM HD with, with with Dr. D. Morgan, and and he has a very diverse educational background and and also experiences. So. Um, we're here discussing the unbroken education of apartheid legacy, one of his books that he's out here, and especially is, is discussing the South Suburban, where he specializes in it, and where predominantly black communities of color um, has, in, in the opinion of many, has, has failed. And uh, even though we have met the, the economic standards of supplying the resources and the money to, um, to supply our kids with what they need, the system continues to fail. fail. And the, the basic procedure that Dr. Morgan talks about is, is the leadership, which in the superintendent and with the Board of Education, has, has, has uh, which are the people that we have voted for, which is uh, also the, super, the Board of Education selects the superintendent. So can, go ahead and elaborate on that a little more. What you, what your well, I think in order to select a great superintendent, one with vision, positive educational leadership, and the ability to develop parent and community leadership, improving, improved teaching and learning, and with good management skills, we must know what leadership looks like. You can't, uh, as a board, you can't select something that you can't describe. If you can't describe what you want, you don't know what you want. And that's the problem that I find with some of these boards who select not the best and the brightest, but they're f only their friends and acquaintances. And it's so important to know what that looks like. Otherwise, you can't have it. Okay. So where do we I go just, from here, Dr. Uh, Morgan? Uh, where do we, we go from We can have as far as we can see, mm -hmm. but no farther. Okay. If we can't see it, we can't have it. If we can't see what constitutes the best and great educational leadership, then we won't select mm -hmm. the best okay. and the brightest okay. in order to turn our schools around. Okay. So we'll select uh, uh, somebody who will, are not able to do that and has get, helped get us where we are now, which is uh, what we see now. So where do we go from here? You, you mean we need to keep continually? Where do we go from here? Yeah, where do we go from here? Tell me. Uh, we need a school uh, board because it all starts with the board at the, at the top, the, the top leadership who picks the leadership, the superintendent. They're the people who pick the superintendent and should evaluate the superintendent and monitor to ensure that the superintendent is doing his or her job. If the superintendent is doing his or her job, then that's holding the superintendent accountable. As the superintendent has to be held accountable that way, then they will be uh, forced to hold everybody in the school district accountable. But if you're not evaluating the superintendent and not holding that person accountable, if you don't even have goals on an annual basis of where do we go, go from here and how are we going to get there, then you're not holding yourself accountable either. Okay. So it really, it all starts with us, okay. the school board. Now tell me this. In order to uh, uh, do the right thing, you must know what the right thing is. Okay. And that requires training okay. now listen and to education this. in order to be an effective board member. Mm -hmm. You can't, we can't teach what we don't know, right. and we can't lead where we don't go. Okay, now tell me this. Give me one or two, three things that you did to turn that school around that you would recommend. Well. Two things that you, you would recommend would. for any school, for any teacher that listen, any superintendent that listen, any charter school that's out there trying to turn the community, um, the low scoring, the inactivity. What, give me three things that you well, you would recommend to any school across 
not even dealing with color. And if it does have to do with color, our low-income performing kids. What are the three things that you did in that Inglewood? We know Inglewood is one of the roughest well, neighborhoods as in the a country. school board, the first thing I would do is follow a regular process to review student achievement data to ensure continuous improvement. And that's, you're doing that's working with the superintendent. We, you meet with the school, when the uh, assessments, our tests come out, you look at it with the superintendent to see whether you're measuring up to the goal that you've set for yourself. And if you're not, then you make uh, some uh, revisions as to uh, how you're going to do that if you're not measuring up to the goal that you've set for yourself. Okay. The next thing, the second thing you do, you take as a school board, especially school boards who have not been in education, who are not educators, you take part in training on principles of continuous improvement, including the use of data and customer focus. Customer? Customer focus, which are the students. Okay, okay. The key is knowing. Knowledge is the principal thing. If you can't know, if you don't know how to do that, then you can't grow, and it will begin to show. The third thing you should do along the same lines is participate in work sessions to better understand needed changes in curriculum and instruction based upon the related data. Say that again. I'm sorry. Say that one more time. Participate in work sessions. What kind of work sessions? Oh, uh, uh, those sessions that will help you better understand uh, the changes that need to be done. So have teachers workshops type of thing? By all means. Any particular? You, in any needs assessments, the purpose of it is to see what needs to be done and see what needs to be taught through in-service teacher work sessions and training and development, people development. So these workshop sessions should be related to, to the data to that you grab. To what we need to know. The data from what you receive. teachers receiving. need to know what staff need to know. Within to that school successful. system. Within that school system. That's, that's correct. Okay. Okay. So you Now, go, the go superintendent ahead. has a direct role in all of this in uh, following a regular process to review student achievement. The superintendent has a role in that. And the superintendent's role is to recommend to the board a process for continuous improvement. Number two, and you have that written down already. Oh, yeah. Take part in training on principles of continuous improvement, including the use of data and customer focus, student focus. What's the superintendent's role in that, in taking part in training? He should schedule, he or she should schedule training on these principles of continuous academic improvement and principles and participate with the board in... Uh, uh, in these training sessions. So he should have a hands-on. You have to have a hands-on superintendent that's involved in communicating back yes. and forth within the board By all to, means. To, 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 yes. to, to make the decisions and, and how it's going to be presented to the students. To get things done and be successful. It's the superintendent and board working together. Right. So you had six, you said you had six. And the third thing I mentioned ahead. was participate Principal. in work sessions right. to better understand needed changes in curriculum. Now, what's the superintendent's role in that? Of course, the superintendent would either he or she does it personally, I have somebody else do it, delegate. They would present the information to the board on needed uh, curriculum and instructional changes based on the data. And, of course, they would explain the data to support these changes, recommended changes. So those are the three things that you mentioned. So there's three triangles. So we put it in a triangle, and then it just keep going in circles. So it's really pretty. In other words, it's simple, stupid. It's like that, right? It's really simple. And the worst of it is just common sense. To do all of this requires funding. And, of course, the board provides the funding for this, for continuous academic improvement. They adopt the board policies. That's the board's role is to adopt policies. And then the, the superintendent and with the school district, working with the school district, carries out those board policies. 
that it supports publicly and communicates the value of continuous improvement to the community. Mm -hmm. In other words, everybody should be involved. Okay. Let me throw the, you for a loop. Uh, the board, mm -hmm. the superintendent, All the right. staff, All right. and the community. Okay, and the community. Community number one, right? They are the people we work for, the students and the community. The community is number one. Yeah, by all means. That's why we're there. Right. So, it's a simple... Now, what are some of the possible agenda items relating to this continuous improvement cycle? Uh, as a, What can we do as a board? And what can we do working with the superintendent and the staff to uh, ensure continuous academic improvement? Mm -hmm. Well, we can review and discuss benchmarks data that our district uses to assess its progress. In other words, student achievement data. That's what we do when we meet with the, follow a regular process to review student achievement, meeting with the superintendent when the data comes out. What else can we do relating to continuous academic improvement? We can proper quarterly, use quarterly reports by staff on progress and measures and implementation of the district's uh, strategic plan. Now, I want now, to ask you this question. We, we write district strategic plans because we should use them and we should look at them and see if we're following them. Otherwise, we're not following them and we're not doing what we should be doing. Now, how effective, how important it is for the elementary school level from kindergarten to sixth to, to be in line with the next level you know, we say kindergarten to eighth grade. Then from to the to the education, the school districts are all are always changing from each step to each step. How is it important that that the um, the guidelines and the data and the information to carry over? Because I see a lot of times when it's, uh, we indis it's indispensable. You can't uh, teach algebra before before you teach taught uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. <laughs> you can't uh, read before you learn your alphabet and the words and sounds. Basic understanding, basic, get the basics. So the, the key is getting down the basics of understanding. And it follows a step by step process. Mm -hmm. And it should be followed. And Bloom's taxonomy of educational objectives that teachers use to write their lesson plans. There are six levels. Knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation. But remember, the first level was knowing, knowledge, knowing. You can't do any of those until you first know. Okay. Now, we're getting close to the you know, last few minutes, 10 minutes of the show, 10, 15 minutes of the show. We're on Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio. Um, with this E to the fourth power, we're, we're here with um, my great friend, Dr. D. Morgan, David Morgan. He's a, a lifetime educator. He has educated me nonstop. I've supported him since the day one we met because he transcended the movement for change within our community. Um, he has done this as a lifetime. He has a book currently out. It's called An O Broken Educational Apartheid Legacy. Okay, And we're discussing some of the things the negative and positive aspects of um, basically um, answers, questions and answers, and it's and how we can basically improve our communities. We have seen loan scores, and Dr. Morgan has done every level of education, and he has brought scores up. Um, but the simple thing of following proper policies and procedures, gathering the necessary data to improve the welfare of the African American community. It's, it's, it's elementary. Am I right, Dr. Morgan? It's elementary, <laughs> I, would, I would say, when you know it. But uh, the most important thing is to know. And the only way we can know is to study. Do our and homework. Are, do our homework. We have to get the blueprint. If we can't get the blueprint, then we can't do the deed. Okay. So we can't build a house without knowing. We can't the, build a house without that. And without the foundation. That's right. That's the foundation. And you, you broke down the basics of what, and I greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure our listeners will, because this, 
this show will be replayed. Um, you can you can go to to our Smooth ninety point five FM HD radio, and you can um, you can um, go to um, iHeart. I was hoping to uh, uh, finish discussing some uh, possible agenda items relating to continuous academic improvement. Okay, if you can do and some in short, these ways, go ahead. Will go make ahead. us one of the best by doing what we should be doing will make us one of the best school, uh, suburban school districts in Chicago. Okay. And in the nation Let, let's hear as well. It. Let's hear it. Uh, we let's are hear heirs it. of a past that gives us every reason to believe that we can succeed. When we do the right thing, when we study what we're supposed to be, when we understand our role and stay in our lane as board members, do the role of a board member, not try to be the superintendent, not try to be the teacher in the classroom, but to do, perform your role and understand what that is. The role of school boards is to improve student performance levels and to productively and democratically engage the school district community to achieve that goal. Now, if you're not doing that, then you're out of your role. And uh, I was want, wanted to uh, mention some things, items relating to continuous academic improvement that had started but we didn't finish. Go ahead. Uh, it's important, in addition to reviewing and discussing benchmarks and quarterly reports by staff on the progress and measures uh, in implementation of district strategic plan, it's also important to report and discuss the district staff development plan for continuous academic improvement, the process. We need to uh, look at the quarterly reports and discuss of key indicators of progress on student academic achievement. We need to uh, yearly report and discuss not only the budget of priorities, but also of the activities to be eliminated with data to justify decisions. In other words, we don't hold on and spend money on things that doesn't work. Checks and balances. Exactly. We need, a, in order to do all of this, we should plan board retreats with the senior staff for self-evaluation of board operations and effectiveness. And I don't mind being self-evaluated. And I would hope, uh, I wish that all mem board members wouldn't mind being self-evaluated. Okay, so you said that the role should also yes. be the community should make the board members, okay, are you reaching our goals? Are you putting doing the work that you said you were going to do when you became a board member exactly. and, and to keep the politics out of it, keep everything out of it, and to focus on the goals that are set, you set to improve the, the goals, student's goal. And the they, vision, the mission, the vision, the goals. Simple. And if they don't, they need to be removed. That's what you're saying. We need a better board when people are not doing their job. And that's true for anything, any walk of life. When, when you're not doing your job, the purpose for which you were sent there, it makes you obsolete. So when, when so it's important that board members learn their job. And as Dr. King used to say, to do a great job and to do their job so well until the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. <laughs> That's Dr. Um, Dr. D. Morgan right there. We on Smooth ninety point five FM HD with radio with Dr. Morgan. I'm having a great conversation with him, and I'm, I've been looking forward to him. And I appreciate you coming out here, um, talking to us, and I look forward to inviting you again um, because. It, and I know uh, you've been going through a few things in the last year, and yes. uh, and um, health wise, and and I'm just blessed. So that you come out here and spread your knowledge and put it on the radio to let everybody know so they can just press that button, you know, at 90.5 FM and review this this interview. This is the legacy, Dr. Morgan. To, yes. to, and it's a pleasure to be talking to you and discussing the, the, um, the, the future, the future of what we need to do to make our, our school systems in, in the African-American community. Because you see a discrepancy of the... The, especially the female. Why has the female, African American female, become so successful as far as getting their education and earning their degrees? Could you elaborate on that just a short period? Because I know we got, you see the clock right there, right? It says 6.53. Okay? So, we, we, I'm just saying, so, why, 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 
tell me, what do you think about this? Because off the book, so we could talk about the book. I am not an expert <laughs> on uh, the African American female, <laughs> although I am married and <laughs> deal with one. All right. But uh, from what I can see, they do the same thing that every other successful person uh, does. They apply themselves. And they follow the procedure. And they follow, they do the things that makes for success. Okay. So they meet and the goals of what you what you expect in, in, in a not broken educational system. And yes. they and they're, and they're they're following the, the rules and they understand the guidelines and and the people who support them is the household also plays a role. How how important is it that the family members be involved in, within the board? Because you when we go to the board, man, we see sometimes two, oh. sometimes twenty, but usually when the issue comes to how important it is that that the family member att- attend these board meetings and, and and tell me how important that is to 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 for them to do that. It's so important that uh, for family. To know what's going on because these are these children are from uh, these students are from families and they need to know what's going on with the board so that they can vote in a board that counts and a board that is about excellence in public education for their students and a board that's about integrity and character and success principles and uh, the and a board that practice what they they preach. Right. It's important that we do the right thing. It's important that we approve standards for student learning. It's important. It's important that we ensure that the curriculum, instruction, and assessment and align is are aligned with student achievement standards. It's important that the board uh, adopts and revises policies to support excellence in public education and to support standards and expectations. It's important for the board to participate in periodic work sessions to review student standards and the district's initiatives to help all students succeed. Dr. Morgan, one thing we, and you, you just brought it up and I'm glad you did. How important. It's it, also no, important no. to encourage community support for these standards. Okay, but how work. important is integrity? Integrity is key. On a scale of one to ten, what would you say integrity? I would say integrity would be a ten. A ten. A ten. We have to be truthful, honest, and open. Truth transforms, vibrates, and transcends time and place. We must tell the truth with a capital T. The truth. And when we are about what we claim to be about and not just pretending as board members and do the work that boards, successful boards do, we too will be successful. Okay. If there was one thing that, if anything, that you want to accomplish through us talking today to, to, to the people as far as education, and, and um, what would that one thing be? What would thing? that one thing be? Mm-hmm. To see that... Uh, we can uh, accomplish the task of getting off of probation, academic probation, the state's watch list, and develop an educational system that is second to none in the south suburbs and all across this nation where there is a black-white academic achievement gap and where there are more black children, where, where, where there are more blacks in prison and in college. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. I, um, we are... <laughs> excellence ahead. in public education can be achieved. We are heirs of a past that gives us every reason to believe that we will succeed. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Morgan, uh, for coming to Eat to the Fourth Power, and, and I'm glad we're able to... We still got a lot to cover, so I look forward to inviting you again. And um, if we weren't prepared to, I think we did pretty good talking together. This is kind of what me and you do all the time. So, you know, once we get our little jitters together, but, and um, the only reason I invite you here is only for the people to know 
But we need to do as a people to, to focus on empowering ourselves and our community. And it's through education. And thank you, Mr. Clifton Graham, for inviting me. All right, all right. You know, I love you and I look forward to talking to you. Yes. With Smooth 90.5 FM HD Radio. Um, we look forward to talking, seeing you next week and um, having Dr. Morgan here again. Um, this is Each of the Four Powers. Thank you for listening and um, we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>